Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we are looking at what makes The Lord of the Rings so popular and important to you. Three books first published in 1954 turned into three movies released 47 years later. The Lord of the Rings has withstood the test of time and remains as debatably one of the greatest stories and worlds that has ever been created. But why is this? If I was to say, The Lord of the Rings is the greatest story ever created, how would you feel about that? Would you say 100% yes? Or do you think something else takes the top spot? Well, I would imagine if you are watching this video then there is a high chance that you may agree with me, and personally, I definitely think this. The reasoning for me to wanting to create this video this week is of course because we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the release of the Fellowship of the Ring movie. I was just 9 years old when it first came out. And as I went to the cinema to celebrate a friend's birthday, I never would have expected in a million years that that would be the day when a new obsession would take over my life. After hearing Kate Blanchett's voice kick everything off, dive into the peace of the Shire, learn about the One Ring and the forming of the Fellowship, I just wanted more. I just wanted to see them hunt some orc. More, more, more. But I am just one person. What about all of you? I thought it would be good fun today to see just what the Lord of the Rings means to everyone, why we think it is so popular and just generally why there is such a love for Tolkien. On this subject, at least to me, it does not matter whether you are talking about the books or the films. J.R.R. Tolkien created the most in-depth fantasy world we are ever likely to see, and Peter Jackson beautifully adapted them into three incredible films. I know some people have issues with the movies, for Peter Jackson did take some liberties with their creation, but I do not necessarily see that as a bad thing. Yes, it would have been nice to get every detail and every character described, but realistically, that would have never fit into a trilogy of films, even if you could somehow get a movie studio to agree to fund it. When you accept that they are making adaptations of the work, and this is a different format, when you take them as their own product and not an insult to the book, then I think you can find a lot of love for them. After all, you do not exactly win 475 awards for your trilogy from 800 nominations if you are making terrible films. And remember too, The Return of the King is the joint record holder for Academy Award wins alongside Ben-Hur and Titanic, all of which have 11. An incredible achievement. I think now would be a good time to look at the man who started it all, John Ronald Rual Tolkien. Tolkien has to be considered a genius for creating the world of Middle-earth, and when talking about his fantasy world, Tolkien himself used the phrase of secondary creation in relation to his works, and this means that Tolkien wanted to create a world with so much depth that you do not even need to suspend disbelief, just so you can feel that you are there. It is more like you automatically develop this secondary belief in his creation. It just happens. Now say yes, it's one of my favourite stories. Tolkien created a world that is so complete that very few other authors before or since can even argue at ever being truly close to challenging. When you have those who only know The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, then they may not fully appreciate it. But when you dive in deeper, you realise that The Lord of the Rings is really only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Tolkien's legendarium. Even if you never have the interest or just the time to delve deeper than The Lord of the Rings, you can still feel the history and depth that is there. We get so many references to past characters, locations or legends that you have to realise just how much work must have gone into creating everything. There has been such a demand for information about his world that even this year just gone, nearly half a century since his passing, his family members are still dissecting his notes, maps and the languages to finish and release more material. I mean, if none of them had ever done this then we wouldn't have even had the Silmarillion. Tolkien loved the details, he created and revised his world obsessively and that's what makes it so riveting. So as great as it would be to know every little detail he ever jotted down onto any scrap of paper, I don't think even he could remember every single bit of it, let alone a reader. 
But what is great about it is that you do not need to know it all to be able to enjoy the Lord of the Rings. You get poems and songs and so many locations and languages, it is as though it is never ending, just like real life. If you didn't know better and you just stumbled upon the world one day, I would not judge you for assuming that dozens of authors from all over the world had contributed to it over several lifetimes. But no, it is the creation of a single man. One man who created thousands of characters. One man who created 15 languages. One man who made a world that inspires countless people. And on a side note about his languages here too, it is said that Tolkien actually initially wrote the whole world just to house the Elvish languages. He did not create the language for the world that he imagined first, like most authors would. Tolkien was also an expert in the history of English, and knew that from this that his languages too would need stories and myths behind them. And so, he just created this, and this became the stories that we know. Now, even with all his work behind him, he still needed a great story to be able to stand the test of time to make something with the longevity that meant I could be here making so many videos on it over 50 years later. The Lord of the Rings is about good overcoming evil. How the most innocent and unassuming characters can rise above the largest obstacles, horrific fears, and terrifying evils through bravery, courage, and inner strength when all seems lost. Stories like this will always inspire the reader. And now, before we move on to focusing on the movies a bit more, I want to ask you all to leave me a comment below. And that is, I want you all to either leave a comment of the movies or the books from how you first got introduced to The Lord of the Rings. I'll be very curious to see which one turns out to have had the bigger influence. I very much guess it's going to depend on when you were born, but still, it'll be interesting to see. But now, this is where we must go into the trilogy of films directed by Peter Jackson. After all, like I said, these are what sucked me into the Tolkien fandom. Without these movies, I may never have picked up one of the books, and I know I am not alone in feeling this. When the film adaptation was first announced, there was so much scepticism about the project. Even the Tolkien estate weren't that keen on the idea. I mean, think about it. How could they possibly convert these three epic books into three manageable movies? I mean, there had even been discussions at one time of doing it all in just two movies. So how did they make all of this work? How did they manage to pull off this impossible project? Well, like we just did with Tolkien, let's go back to the beginning. In fact, three years before any camera even started rolling. This was how long Jackson made sure he had to ensure everything was as perfect as it could have possibly been before starting the production. Every location needed to look authentic. Every casting choice needed to be just right. Every org had to look disgustingly great. This attention to detail was continued throughout the entire project, the kind of attention to detail that Tolkien possessed himself. Jackson even made sure every film had at least one year in post-production as well, and that each movie had its own separate editor so that they could keep editing without the stress of having to cut multiple films at the same time without a break. He also did an incredible job of figuring out how to use all available kinds of visual effects to get the look of the film as good as it possibly could be, including introducing groundbreaking technology to push on the ability to have full CG characters that appear real enough to act on screen alongside regular actors, or to be able to simulate massive armies with hundreds of thousands of body and make them still look real. The Lord of the Rings integrates false perspective, amazing practical effects, prop miniatures or big miniatures, in other words bigatures as they were named by the crew. There was also the feeling that most of the people who worked on those movies did not do so just because it was their next job, but because it was something very special to be involved with. Everyone who worked on it says the same. You only need to go as far as the people from Weta. They put in a huge amount of work and it really feels like it was a labour of love and that that passion just comes across in the end product. Although this next point can and will be debated, one of the main things I believe that was done right is the way in which Peter Jackson adapted the original material. Okay, yes, some decisions were iffy ones, but generally I don't think he did too much wrong. He cut out some of the arguably less relevant parts gave some more attention to the battle scene, 
Prince. And what was left after all of these changes was an epic, thrilling journey that keeps you captivated from start to finish. One of the smarter decisions made on the production of the film was how Peter Jackson insisted on making the film feel as more a depiction of actual historical events rather than a fantasy epic. Sadly, a decision he did not appear to think of when he came to make The Hobbit. But The Hobbit movie trilogy is just one for a whole other day, a whole other subject, we won't go into that for now. And I will say, if you have a few hours to kill, I cannot recommend enough the special features on the extended editions of the movies. Again, these are the kind of things that just made me want to make movies myself. They bring you such an in-depth look that is eye-opening to just see how the props department was so dedicated that not only did they handcraft thousands of swords, shields, chainmail suits and helmets, all with their own distinguishing characteristics, but they put this kind of detail into everything that they made. That same level of care went into every level of production. The actors learnt new fictional languages, the VFX artists worked around the clock, and it is claimed Peter Jackson was averaging only about 4 hours sleep a night to make sure everything was done right. Rarely if ever has such incredible ambition and drive been exhibited on a project of this size. Generally these days blockbusters are paycheck movies, not something that the movie makers necessarily are particularly attached to emotionally, more something that, kind of like I've mentioned before, is just their next job. The Lord of the Rings, however, was the definition of a passion project, and after devoting nearly eight years of incredible care to every conceivable aspect of the production, the filmmakers gave the audiences everywhere one of their all-time great cinematic gifts. Even though all of the movies do run for more than three hours, they could have been so much longer, and Jackson did have some good sense to keep much of it for the extended editions. The story from the books was stripped down to its bare bones, focusing on the members of the Fellowship and generally not bearing too far away from any of them. The focus stays on two primary objectives, the main quest to destroy the Ring and the war to keep Sauron from destroying Middle-earth, which are obviously very closely linked to each other. Jackson would wisely choose to avoid including the likes of Tom Bombadil, the Barrow Whites or even the scouring of the Shire sections. Although these could have all made great moments, for the narrative they weren't necessarily important. So basically, he kept the main narrative front and centre. When it comes to making a movie that works, something very important is having your audience connecting to the characters, and a large part of this comes down to the actors who portray them. Quite a number of the actors in The Lord of the Rings were not actually that well known before the movies were released, and this was due to Peter Jackson being more concerned about getting the right people rather than getting the big names. Not that a few big names aren't in the end, having the likes of Ian McKellen as Gandalf perfectly depicts how knowledgeable and caring he is, while also being powerful and inspiring when he needs to be. The four main hobbits are played brilliantly as they transform from carefree and joyful to mature and burdened by their roles in the conflict. Viggo Mortensen stands out as Aragorn and is one to remember as he plays the humble and noble hero that fulfills his destiny. And of course you cannot miss out the performance of Andy Serkis as Gollum, an insane and demented monster with a flicker of humanity left inside of him. Realistically, the entire cast deserves their own special mention. These films are truly packed with star-studded performances, and it just shows the casting was just done right. Peter Jackson even made the perfect call when deciding to film everything in New Zealand. The films are packed full of wide aerial shots that show off the breathtaking natural landscapes. It really helps to create the epic world that is just so important to The Lord of the Rings and that fantasy feel. Then as the cherry on top, when you add the music of Howard Shaw over it all, it really becomes something inspiring and legendary. There's a reason he won best score for two out of the three films. The music is so emotional and makes full use of a large orchestra and choir to set up the tone of the series. There are just so many memorable themes, from the main fellowship theme, to the theme of the Shire, to the ride of the Rohirrim. Again, everything he made deserves its own mention. And now, for those of you who are more interested in the action rather than the story, The Lord of the Rings does not let you down here either. It features some of the all-time great film battle scenes. 
Legends, there are both smaller skirmishes, such as the Fellowship's battle in the Mines of Moria, or Sam and Frodo's climactic battle against Gollum, as well as the larger scale epic battles as well, like that of Helm's Deep or on the Pelennor Fields being the most memorable of them all. For example, the Helm's Deep battle is set up throughout the second movie and is beyond epic both visually and by scale, and as a result is widely regarded as the greatest battle ever shown on screen. We see and feel the threat of the Urukai and then the tension that builds as they march from Isengard to Helm's Deep. The intimidation and fear that they create is perfect. There are highs and lows and a dramatic ending that creates the first bit of hope for the forces of good after seeing so much darkness. And in fact here, if you would like to see more of a breakdown of this battle, I cannot recommend the YouTube channel Nerdwriter enough. Not that they would really need a shout out from me, but their video on the Battle of Helm's Deep is incredible and worth the time to watch if that is something that you're interested in. But then we have the Battle of Minas Tirith, which is even larger in scale to match the trilogy's climax. There are more orcs, more men, more catapults, a wolf-headed battering ram, Moomakil, trolls and the Nazgul. It is brutal, it is moving, and it is brilliant. And of course it contains one of the greatest speeches and cavalry charges that you are ever likely to see. One more reason as to why The Lord of the Rings is so popular and why it continues to stand the test of time is because of the relatable themes that run throughout it. The hobbits are thought of as irrelevant and cowardly, but throughout the movies our four main hobbits grow in strength and character to prove that even though they are short in stature, they are large in character and bravery. One of the most moving scenes in any of the films is when the newly crowned Aragorn the King and the combined forces of good all bow to the hobbits in thanks for their deeds. Even a side character such as Eowyn has a story that is similar in that a woman who is not thought of as a warrior or leader overcomes these stereotypes by the time the film ends. And this proves to her uncle, King Theoden of Rohan, that gender is irrelevant when it comes to bravery or a worthy sacrifice. If you're a great person and a great leader, it just doesn't matter. The greater good and value of friendship are themes that also occur over and over again as well. Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli form a bond of friendship and commitment that overcomes the centuries old conflicts between their different races. Sam and Frodo's friendship is one of the main things that they cling on to during their perilous journey to Mordor as well. It is Sam's sacrifice and willingness to do whatever it takes to save his friend and the rest of the world that tugs at your heartstrings. In fact, Sam is such a great character that Tolkien himself considered Sam to be the true hero of the story. So as we begin to approach the end of the video, hopefully this gives you an insight into why I at least believe that The Lord of the Rings is just so brilliant, popular and still going strong 20 years after the release of the Fellowship of the Ring movie. There is such an attention to detail throughout all of Tolkien's work that creates an entire world with incredible depth that you will have no issue suspending disbelief in any way. When delving into the world that is Middle Earth it feels very much like reading about history, not a made up universe. This in turn was the film's greatest asset. They had the sense to replicate Tolkien's work ethic and it paid off. The Lord of the Rings continues to be one of the go to movies and books on just how to create a story that can last the ages. But now is the time for you guys to come into things. Recently, over social media and our community tab on the channel, I have asked just what Tolkien means to you. So I thought it would be great to include some of your opinions and not just mine. I will admit I had hundreds of replies to the posts I put up, so I can't show every single one, but here are just a few. Scroach loves how it is not just a story, it's a universe. Big Sarge loves how Tolkien poured himself into his work. Mason appreciates how Tolkien helped him get through tough times in his own life. Celestial Rosalie loves how it feels more magical every time she reads it. First Last loves how it never feels like a repeat, there is always something deeper to discover. Obama Last Name loves how The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings just barely scratch the surface. And Baseball Snakes 25 loves how it is a great escape from the real world. These are just a few examples of the many, many of you who replied to my posts, and I cannot thank you all enough for taking the time to do so. 
being able to read through every single one of your responses really showed just how many ways Tolkien managed to inspire so many people, and how Peter Jackson brought it to the front of a whole new generation. We have our bro Hiram here, and we all share our love for Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. I really could not ask for better company. And so, I hope you have all enjoyed this video for today. It is something slightly different to normal not being lore, but being more of a love letter to Tolkien if want for a better phrase. But now that we have reached the end, it leads me to my question for you all today, and that is, how do you feel about the Peter Jackson adaptation? Do you think that they did a disservice to Tolkien's books, or do you think that they were great for the medium of film and brought a whole new set of eyes to this epic fantasy world? Or perhaps you just sit on the fence and you're a bit 50-50. Please let me know all of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below. And also just to add here, if you missed our 100,000 subscriber livestream, I will link it below as we are doing a Weta Workshop mini epic giveaway to celebrate and all the details you need for that will be in the comment section of the video. We have decided to extend the chance to enter this until the new year, so it gives the chance for more winners to win something. So until we reach the new year, please go over to that video and enter by leaving a comment, it is just that easy. So now at the very end, I need to mention our other channels, which will all be linked below if you'd like to check them out, and also to shout out our patrons. Firstly, we have our Divine Power tier members of Kevin, Abram and Matt, you are all awesome. And a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nashith, Denver, Steel and Gregory. And as well, I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew and Finrod Felagund. You are all true legends of the Brohirim. And finally, a massive thank you if you have managed to make your way through all of this video with me today and stuck around to the very end. Please, if you have not already, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon if you have enjoyed what you've seen. And so, once again, a massive thank you from me, and I will see you next time on the Broken Sword.